let's get started. Uh, this session is uh, one of the most interesting sessions, I think, that uh, you'll see in this for the next, say, 45 minutes. Uh, it, <laughs> it, because um, we've had a lot of great sessions here, and I hope everybody agrees with me there. But this is another one that is just really superior. And uh, I will probably say that Idaho was the very first state DOT that even started talking about using AVL on equipment. Uh, there's a lot of DOTs that have the devices on their vehicles and, uh, and have had them on there for a long time, but they, they haven't taken that data and pulled it into their maintenance management system or their asset management system. And, and that's what the, the next session is on. And the presenter is Steve Spohr. Steve's a, a longtime uh, engineer with Idaho DOT and um, uh, been involved with uh, different Idaho projects with Agile Assets for a number of years. And, and um, uh, I want you to help me welcome Steve Spohr. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, public speaking isn't one of my fortes, so kind of help me get through this, and we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm going to have to use these because age is catching up with me finally, as much as I hate to admit it. Um, as Jim said, my name is Steve Spohr. I'm the maintenance services manager with the Auto Transportation Department. Um, another unique role that I have is kind of unique you know, because I'm also the department's fleet equipment fleet manager, so I serve in the two roles. So when you start talking about AVL from an operations and an equipment standpoint, that was a natural tie for me since I'm basically attached to both units of it. So like I said, well, I'm not a real good at publicly speaking in my mind. Um, so one of the things that really helps me is if you have questions as we're going through this, please ask, raise your hand, let's engage in a conversation. Um, it'll make things a little easier for me, you'll get more out of it, and I think we'll have a little more fun with it. Um, to kind of give you an idea of where we, what got us here, or I guess, let me back up one thing. When I first was asked to put this together, I thought it really was to be base, a discussion about what Idaho's done as far as automating AVL data into our maintenance management system. Um, when I talked to Jim about what he really wanted me to do, it kind of plays back on what Stuart started the conference off with out on Tuesday, is the value of the data. How can the data be of value to the agency to do something with? So I kind of changed my focus a little bit if you want details on exactly how we're importing the, the AVL data right into our maintenance management system, be happy to meet with you and sit down and go over it. But my goal of today here is to show you how we're using that data to bring value to the organization. Okay? So to start, um, it makes sense to kind of give you a little bit of history about ITD. Did that go? Bottom. Bottom? Yeah. It's backwards. Okay? Um, so a little bit of history about kind of what, where we got here. Um, in 2010, um, ITD, for lack of a better term, let our director go at the time. And in 2011, we had a new director. One of the first things our new director did was basically is implement a new strategic plan and a new mission for the department. Very simply, our mission, your safety, your mobility, your economic opportunity, kind of sounds a little similar to what Stuart said on Tuesday. So I think it's kind of the genesis of the organization and where we're all going. When I talk about our strategic plan, this is it. It's not some 22 or 30 page document, is this, this entire leaflet, our entire strategic plan is contained right here. Very simplified, very easy to read, and hopefully very easy for people involved in operations to understand how they're involved in engagement. Is that leaflet the same that's on your... Yep. Just the same, that, okay. That's it. That's it. Right. That's it. So, very simple. So, as you can see, there's some other things associated with it that we talked about. Um, so, when the director implemented this new strategic plan, from an operational standpoint, we tried to figure out where can we, or how do we as an operations group, basically contribute to the strategic plan and moving forward. For Idaho, it was very easiest for us to identify. 
When you look at operations, 50% of our operations budget is involved in winter response and winter maintenance. Therefore, at 50%, it became the easiest place to make an impact, and so that is what we concentrated on it. So that's kind of what led us to this whole data management, utilizing data to improve winter operations. A couple of other things that come into play I want to bring up. Prior to that, we had a district engineer in the southeast corner of the state who started looking at data trying to improve his winter operations within his district. He was using our ARWIS system, which stands for our Road Weather Information Management System, that, for those that don't know. And he started looking at the data that he could derive from that system. As a result of what he was doing, he created a winter storm severity index, which basically takes into account temperature, precipitation, and wind to develop a storm severity index, is what he was trying to look at. Um, wind, as we have learned over time, is not a big factor, but he had to use wind in his particular district because they have a lot of wind associated with their winter storms. Over time, we've kind of found out the wind doesn't really affect things, but he had to appease the players at hand at the time. What he went from there, once he developed this storm severity index, then he basically tried to look at time. Because what we're really trying to do in regards to winter operations, if a road ices up, gets snow covered, how much time does it take it to get it back to a natural state? So once he added the element of time to it, we came up with our very first winter performance measure called our winter performance index. So, and I'm not going to go into great detail on those, but that's how we got started in this whole data thing in regards to winter operations. So what happened with that index is that we're basically looking at storm, severity, precipitation, how much time can we get it down to. And the faster we do that, the better we did. What we started to realize after one year of implementing that in one district and starting to look around, we had crews that were being very proactive, getting out there before a storm, treating a storm with, the with chemicals and whatever, to where we really had no ice or, water or snow accumulation. And in those cases, the way the index was set up, they got a score of zero because the road never got icy. So that led us to another index called our mobility index. And what mobility index stands for in ITD is basically is that time when a road is below freezing, has water on, or has liquid on it, but there's no ice. Basically, we have the right amount of chemical to prevent the formation of ice. And so that is one of our objectives. So that was our forte into basically utilizing data to basically manage winter maintenance and increase the value. Um, so what I want to do today is talk about the value of the data and how we're using AVL data. Um, I've kind of classified it into three basically area, three areas. We utilize the data with our ROWIS system. Um, our ROWIS system is from Vaisla Navigator. It uses basically sensors. Um, non-invasive pucks or non-invasive data sensors, and the ARWA system is basically the data source for our winter performance measures. The other application, as we want to talk about, is automatically putting the data to our MMS, which is what you're all familiar with that we've talked a little bit about, or in our WAR system. And the third portion of it is what we're really getting into now and developing now is the reporting from our WAR system that creates unique reporting that you're not going to get from a maintenance management system that really pertains to data specific to what the trucks are doing and the operators are doing and to understand their operations. Steve, yes? How many um, We have 128. I'm going to get to that a little bit, give you a little more detail, but we have 128 in the state, two more being built right now, so we'll have 130. Okay. So to kind of get us started and kicked off and rolling, it would be, it's, I need to give you an idea of what AVL we're using and how we got there and our story. In 2007, we bought our first mobile data collector for our snowplow trucks. Um, equipped it in the fleet that we bought that particular year and got absolutely nothing out of it. We quickly learned that the mobile data collector we bought, the manufacturer of that, really didn't like the manufacturer of the spreader controller we had and they basically refused to talk together to create an interface to where the two systems would work so we could record any data. Lesson one learned. Next step that we went into is the same district that created the winter performance measures took the initiative to buy some um, Force America controllers with some mobile data collectors that Force basically provides as a pilot program to understand how mobile data collection could be used to improve their operations. That pilot program was basically what was the catalyst for us moving forward in the manner that we have. 
What the operations manager found down in that particular district, once he had data from a truck to look at and to understand what his operators were doing, how they were applying material, where they were applying material, he was able to work with those operators to identify improvements in efficiency and things like that. One particular operator he found by working with the operator, they saved 40% of the material that they were using. When you consider that our salt budget, which is very small compared to New York's, is only about $7 million a year, still at 40%, that's roughly $2.5 million savings if we can apply that savings across the state. $2.5 million would have paid for everything that we've done with ABL going forward at this point in time. So the payback became very obvious and very quick. Because of that success of that, our executive management made the decision to go ahead and move forward with an ABL program and to start and basically allocated the funding to do that. So that was, that was our catalyst. The next thing that we did was trying to figure, okay, how do we move forward with this state application or statewide program or enterprise model, I guess, of this whole thing? So we created a contract where we went out for bid for mobile data collectors. At the time, we had various other controllers. We had Monroe, we had Force America, we had Raven, we had Grecian, you know, all the controllers we, uh, you're all, if you're involved in equipment, would know about. So we wrote a contract basically requiring a mobile data de collector, a communication protocol, which in case most everybody uses is cellular, and then for them to provide the information for us in a way that we could use it. At least the one thing we did write in that contract is when we did it is we didn't buy basically a whole bunch of devices and then start installing them. We made the vendors install it in 10 trucks so that we could basically proof of concept of what they were providing to us. Um, good move on our part. They had about 10 installed. Within the first month, we started seeing data quality issues. We started checking with them. They also found out that even though they said they could talk to all of our controllers, they could actually only talk to two of the four that we had. So we were getting no data in the crosswalk, very similar to our first application. And we found that the data controllers they were talking to, they were basically interpreting the data in such a way that the data that they were reporting was not the same data that the controller was sending to them. Poor data quality. Okay, if you're going to go to AVL, if you got poor data, why even bother going to it? So we, at that point, we quit that contract and, and we basically settled with the vendor to move away. Where we got to where we are now is at that point in time, which would have been about 2010, we had bought our very first Cirrus Spread Smart controller. Doing some other things with Cirrus, we started talking to them a little about AVL and what we were trying to do, and Cirrus um, politely informed us as well, do you realize the Spread Smart controller has a mobile data collector built right into it? You can't even buy the controller without a mobile data collector there, okay? So that addressed our concerns about data quality. So we started checking on some of the things they were providing and looking at us. The quality was accurate. The other thing I talked about earlier is with the first vendor is we were trying to communicate via cellular. If you haven't been to Idaho, there's some huge canyons. It's very remote. Cellular is not a statewide solution in Idaho. There are places in the state where you cannot get an actual cell phone call. Um, a lot of people still live there. So all of a sudden we started to realize the cellular communication protocol was not going to be a statewide solution for us, so we had to look at something else. So in talking to Cirrus, what they basically informed us is they communicate via Wi-Fi. Simply put a bridge in the truck, every time the truck would come in with Wi-Fi range, the system would download. The good thing for us is we had already put Wi-Fi communication at every single one of our maintenance sheds or garages, as you may call them. So the communication aspect was already in our infrastructure and we were ready to go. So we made the decision after looking at what they had, as far as hardware, we started looking at the various software components that they had. They already had mobile, or mobile downloads, so you could download the information. They already had a product called Data Smart in which you could look at the information and read the information and understand the information. So as we started to look at it, we now realized they meet all of our hardware requirements. They meet our communication requirements. They have the software in play. Based on our test, data was accurate. We made the decision to move forward that that would become our statewide application. So in 2013, we basically started moving forward of retrofitting every single snowplow truck in the state with a Cirrus Controls Spread Smarter X controller. I'm very happy to say that this spring, we finally completed all 409 plow trucks in Idaho are now equipped with a Spreadsmart controller moving forward. Um, we also now have two tow plows. 
um, cirrus can basically hook to the tow plows. We'll also be getting data from our tow plows as we move forward. Okay. So here's the data flow of the AVL information we're going to get it. So we're kind of getting into really the crux of what we're after. Obviously, the trucks will generate the data. The data is then downloaded into the Cirrus Data Smart application. From there, it splits it in two ways. So we use the data, in, or our goal is to use it in three different ways now, and I think we'll find even more. The first way is the data is pulled off to this, what we call a TO server, treatment observation server, that Cirrus keeps for us. And then they pipe that information directly to Vaisla, and Vaisla then basically displays AVL information on the Vaisla Navigator page, and I'll go over that in a little bit and show you what that looks like. We then also take the same data, send it to our WARS application that we built in-house. It's processed, geo-processed, created and put into a format that um, our maintenance management system will adhere. The operator does a quick review of the data, has to input one thing, which is stockpile ID, and then he hits the submit button. It goes to our TAMS application, our MMS, then TAMS feeds our AMS, which is our financial system, and generate reports from there. So we're, that's how the data flow of the data. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit now about the RWIS and the AVL data integration. This is the first thing that we got accomplished with AVL data, and the results have been phenomenal. As I said, we have 128 RWIS sites. Um, we, RWIS basically has roadway data, atmospheric data. Um, As far as atmospheric data, obviously we got weather, wind, precipitation, temperature. Um, from the roadway portion of it, the data that we collect is water equipment layers in the terms of water, snow, or ice, pavement temperature, pavement condition. The system will tell us whether the road is snow covered, ice covered, slushy, things like that. And most importantly, through the vice of the network and what they do with their sensors and the algorithm that they have, they create a grip value for us. GRIP became basically the one key element of the RWIS system that really helps us define our winter performance measures, and you'll really see it's how we've used that value to basically improve our overall operations. So a little bit about, more about Vaisla. Um, several different panels within the system. Um, we have the, basically the picture wall, when you blog into it and bring it up, you can basically see all the different art road conditions I think you're all very familiar with as a state agency. Um, other things we have is a forecast text, the map, and then one of the things that we're doing also too is we look up, we hook up with the National Weather Service. So when an operator logs onto our, our, our WIS network, he can also get National Weather Service forecasts. The beauty about what we're, how our people are using this is it basically tells the operators exactly what's happening on the roadway. So RWIS has also helped save us become more efficient. We're now long longer doing what we call winter road patrol, running down the road, guys just to see what's going on with the weather and things like that. Through the RWIS and how it does or vice the network, we can also look at weather trends, what's happening. We have a very strong relationship with NOAA, so we do lots of forecasting. One of the things that we've changed in our winter operations, we no longer schedule crews by shift. We schedule crews by the storm. So if a storm is coming in on a Wednesday, we know it's going to be fairly long. When we get into winter, none of the crews will work Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday. They'll be on site when the storm's going to hit on Wednesday. They'll work through the storm so that we have all of our resources there to hit the storm, attack it, get the roads in good condition. When the storm's over, then they go home. So that has helped us tremendously. It's also helped us reduce our overall labor pool. Yeah. Yes? Very much so. Um, one nice thing about Idaho as a Calvert is we are a non-union state. So it made doing things like that, scheduling by storm, very easy. We didn't have to get a union's approval. We just said, you work here. Here's your work hours for this week. The thing about it, the crews also like the idea. When you're doing shifts, crews are then on, on call. When you're on call, you can't go enjoy life per se. So therefore, they're no longer on call. They can go live their lives knowing that, okay, I gotta go to work Tuesday and I'm ready to go to work. So we actually have gotten good buy-in from that. And let's face it, a lot of the guys, you know, they prefer 410s 
When we were doing it the other way in the winter, they were working five eighths, so now they're back to four tens or three and a half days. So they work three and a half days a week in a week, and then they're off. So it really has been worked good. Okay. So here's the graph that we utilize the most from an ROS. And to kind of help those of you that don't know this, I'll try to explain this real quick because you can kind of see the benefit. This pink line that you see right here is the algorithm grip line that it looks at. So what this graph is basically telling you is at this point in time, this road got grip. Here you can see this is the snow or the ice accumulation layer over time. So it stands to reason the ice went up, the grip went down, kind of makes sense. The other thing that's on this graph is where is we also have the road state or the snow and some other information down here. But where the integration comes into play is each of these little icons basically is, basically is when a truck went by the ROS site. So how our system is configured is any time a truck goes by an ROS site, it's, um, it's, got it, it's geo fenced. Then Visela grabs the information from that truck and basically posts it here. So when you start looking at the NIST terms, you can see that as the trucks go by, all of a sudden we get a little cut, tick up and grip. That's because the truck is plowing snow, adding chemical, we're melting some ice. What you're going to see in this situation, though, is as it goes by over a short duration of time, the grip goes down, the ice freezes back up. So what our people have learned from this particular exercise, when you start looking at when trucks go by in this kind of sawtooth application, is we're not putting down enough chemical. We're not doing it at the right time. We're getting chemical dilution so that now we apply chemical. And so in some cases, we're actually making the road worse as opposed to improving its overall condition. We're responding. Go ahead, Stuart. A question there. How, how do you measure grip? It's an algorithm that Vicella developed based on the sensors that they have. And I don't know how they came up with the algorithm, but it works. Have That's, you calibrated it to make sure that it... We've based the grip. when What we've done is observations. As you can look at these observations, when the grip goes down, you can see snow and ice on the road. And when the grip's back up, it's clear. So it, it correlates. Okay. okay? So in this particular instance, basically in this 24-hour period, which is what you see here, every one of these trucks basically went by this ROS site. Just so you can see how many applications, how many passes we made of this truck going down the road. So what we've used this screen for is to try to teach our operators what you're doing, what effect you're having on the road, and trying to get better at what we're doing. So a couple of other things is if you click on an individual truck icon, it'll bring up this window. And so here's some of the information for the window. It gives you, obviously, truck speed, direction. Um, we've got air and pavement temperatures, um, the status of the spreader. So he was in normal. He was not blasting. Um, material type. Um, when we set up our system, we configured all of our controllers with the various material types. One thing we learned from the state of Iowa, you have to have consistency if you're going to implement an AVL program. If you have different controllers in different parts of the states and different material names, how can you correlate what's really going on? So we, when we implemented all 409 trucks, we standardized on the material list. Now, granted, we have 10 granular materials we can use, but it's a standardized list in every single controller. So other information you have is the rates that they were doing and the information and things like that. So you can, again, drill down if you're trying to understand what's going on into individual, individual application and see what the case was. So this is the same road a month later, roughly the same storm. Based on what they learned before and the operators diving into it, you can now see that the grip level stays much higher. You can also now see when the grip started to go down, a truck went by and immediately we got grip back. Same thing again here, here, and here. The thing I want to drive at this is you can see how many fewer passes over a 24-hour period for roughly the same type of storm we incurred. Fewer passes means we're saving money. The grip value shows that we improved the condition of the road as well. So not only did we have greater success at providing a better product to our customers, we did it at a less cost. The only change that they did in this particular instance is they increased the application rate of salt by about 10%. Questions? The, the Vaisla, uh, sensors, are they embedded in the road? No. They're on a pole. They're infrared sensors. They're non-invasive sitting above the ground. So 
So you never have to worry about paving over them. We've done that on the old style quite a lot. Okay? It's happening now, and that's one of the things I want to get to, so if you can give me about five to six oh. minutes. We'll, no, no, that's fine. No, good questions. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about how we're using the data is obviously importing it directly into our MMS. If you're all familiar with this screen, I think everybody's seen it, anybody that has the MMS application, um, you know, you have to create a, whoops. You have to create a work order for an operator. When he gets done being out in a truck for 10 to 12 hours, he has to come in and fill out all the individual day cards. Um, what we found once we implemented mobile or the, our, our, this MMS is the quality of the data that guys would enter after plowing trucks, for lack of a better term, was horrendous. And it's not a factor of the system or anything like that. It comes back to what Jim was saying earlier. These guys were hired to drive truck, plow snow, and take care of the roads. They are not data entry clerks. They don't want to be data entry clerks. So as a result, um, if they do create a work order, it's very highly summarized. Um, what you're going to find is a guy will be out there for 12 hours. He'll put 12 hours to one work order, whatever activity that may be, and call it good. Um, so we get lots of data errors for equipment, hours and miles. We get lots of material quantity errors, accomplishments errors. Um, the biggest error that we saw, which kind of is ironic, is the whole point about this system is it's an asset management system. So you're trying to track cost to your assets. 90% of the records we would get is guys would never figure out, fill out the location day card because they were on so many locations, they just said to hell with it and never did it. So what value is the system and the data in it if it's not basically charging it? So we had to find a better way to improve this process. So we started looking at AVL data, and the reality is, is AVL data is all the data elements you need to complete this. So why not just, if it's already in one computer system, why do a manual entry to put it into another one? Why not automate the process? And that is what we came up when we created our WAR system. Basically, we, information comes from the Cirrus controls to the data smart. It goes into this WAR system through some coding that we created. It creates basically an operator daily summary. Also in the back end, what it does is then it creates all the activities and drives all the activities based on the sensor data of the AVL. We've simplified our winter maintenance activities to a total of six that are applicable. Five of these can be derived based on data elements generated from the truck. Um, where as far as the data elements, we track application rates, conveyor on, um, liquid application rates, plow position, and between those three and the material type, if the operator blogs into the controller, we can calculate all five of our maintenance activities and derive it strictly from the data. The work system then, as once an operator submits it, basically all he does is it auto-creates all the work orders into the MMS, it automatically approves all of the day cards, and it automatically completes all the day cards. So there's no supervisor oversight, and the operator can basically do his check at the end of the day in about five minutes, as we said earlier before. Okay. So a real quick overview of what the WAR system, what the screen looks like. This is what the daily summary screen. When an operator logs in, his name will be up here at the top. It will be today's date. It will automatically default. We use single sign-on at ITD, so once he's logged onto the computer, he's already logged onto this system. What the system, this summary basically gives you real quick is it breaks down all the maintenance activities by route. So now we have the location day cards. And again, this is just a summary. So for this particular guy, he has a combination of, what is it, six different activities and routes that he may have been on. The other nice thing about this is it also tells us when we're not on an ITD route, off-system route, so we can actually calculate the information from that. Other portion of the system, it has a map on it, and it has what we call these Cirrus points, where they're these little black X marks. Um, our Cirrus system, we take a record every six seconds. So when you log into the system, if the guy wants to see where his route and check his route, and he wants to find particular information, he can click on these serious points and see exactly what's going on. So very similar information here that you saw on the Vaisla, same information being run. 
The other thing about this is supervisors can log into this so they can see what the operators were doing and things like that. And again, kind of a quality check. And then here becomes where the detail, and we start getting really carried away. We all know there's huge amounts of information that's in a system and you can do it. So what, how this works is you know, when you before, you'll notice these, these individual boxes over here. So the blue level is the summary level. The green level is the work order level, and the yellow level is basically the detail in regards to the equipment that was used, hours, miles, and the material. When the operator gets to here, I'm not going to show you the functionality because I don't want, if we can do a demo if you're really interested in it. All the operator has to do at this point is he does a click on an icon up here that talks about stockpile ID. He basically opens it up, enters his stockpile that he pulled the material from. Again, now we're not basically asking for material that we loaded into the truck. Now we're basically charging material that was applied to the road. He just enters the stockpiles that he may have used that day, the time frames in which he basically loaded, and the system will separate it, and it will properly charge or assign each stockpile ID to the particular work order. Once he gets that done, he hits the submit button, and the information all goes to our MMS automatically. He's done for the day. Okay, so to give you an idea, when we collapse it, what we have found is what, guys, we used to do one work order a day for a 12 hour shift. We found one instance last year where one guy created 80 different work orders in one day. Because now we're basically separating the activities, separating the routes, truly understanding what's going on. Um, I was asked one time, what do you do with that much data? Um, you're starting to see some of the things we're doing with it, but from an MMS perspective, it now allows us to basically change our reporting. We can get more granularity of the data, therefore more granularity of the reporting, and we can get roll-up information if we really need to. It has really helped the reporting and understanding what's truly going on with the assets in regards to our winter operations. Okay. So the third and final thing that we're using Snowplow AVL data for is what we call Snowplow Operations Assessment. This is a newer thing that we're implementing right now. Basically what it is is the reporting or specialized reporting that we're getting out of the war system kind of address one of your questions. Um, the first one is what we call a storm summer report. Um, it's a report that basically individual operators or managers or foremen can go in. They can query data by date, operator, equipment number, the district, the foreman, the shed, route, combination routes, whatever. What we're trying to do with this is when we implemented winter performance measures, we're using RWIS data. RWIS system is at a single point. It does, and so it's our intent that that single point represents the entire roadway. Now, through the storm summary report, what our expectation is is that the operators and the foreman will now be pulling data specifically to the route that that RWIS represents to ensure that our operators basically aren't quote unquote hot spotting the RWIS site that they truly are being consistent across their applications, all in an effort to, again, approve the overall conditions of the roadway. Okay? Some of the outcomes we expect, crew efficiency, consistent, consistency, and things like that. Second report we're doing comes back to an operator exception report. Again, this is AVL data. It's not in the maintenance management system, so you have to drive it from here. So kind of asking your question. Some of the exception reporting we're doing, plowing and excessive speeds. Um, how many guys have, you know, we know what an ideal plow speed should be from a safety perspective. We've all seen it within our crews of people plowing at 65 or 60 miles an hour, 55. I've actually witnessed it. I actually was on an interstate in the passing lane and a plow was coming at me in the other way in the passing lane and he threw snow on the oncoming passing lane. He was going so fast. Okay. Spreading speeds. We all know that the cost of materials trying to be more efficient. If you're going excessively fast when you're trying to spread salt, you get bounce. Salt ends up in the ditch, not on the road where it won't do anything. Again, trying to improve our overall efficiency. Spinner speed. We have a policy that basically says you will only spread material in a single lane, not across multiple lanes. Again, bounce, trying to control that, understand what's going on. Pre-wet use. We have definitely learned using pre-wet improves the efficiency and improves the speed at which salt and acts and it's just it saves money to use it so we're trying to basically one of the exceptions the guys aren't using pre-wet why let's find out let's get it taken care of so we're gaining efficiency through material savings application rates conditions things like that the last one is one that we're kind of still working on right now it's called our mobility cost efficiency index 
And what this is, is basically, through our winter performance metrics, what we're trying to do is basically show that the roads are in good condition, that we're melting ice. Let's face it, if 200 pounds will melt the ice and a guy puts out 500 pounds per lane mile, he's guaranteeing his road will be in good shape. But he's not being efficient. See? So what we're trying to do is create a report by which we understand what, through our application matrices, what the correct application rate is. And so then we're running this application matrix to see what they actually did do on the road as far as total material put down versus what they probably could have done or gotten away with and then moving forward. Um, we're creating a program within ITD. It's a horizontal career path. This is going to be one of the things that basically enables someone to move along. Their efficiency index has to be within a certain range and it basically narrows up over time. Again, we're trying to stress and move forward the idea that doing a great job and responding is good, but let's get more efficient at what we're doing and do it for the least cost possible. And this is a report that's going to help us do it. Yes? Pre-wetting is basically any liquid. So it could be, in our case, we use lots of salt brine. We use some mag chloride. So you're pre-wetting the granular material before it actually hits the road with a liquid. OK, because when salt's wet, then it reacts quicker as opposed to having to dilute to start the process. Alex. Excuse me? Um, basically, any time the truck comes back into the shed through the Wi-Fi, it will download. Our processing time through all of the GIS it takes about 10 minutes. So once a truck hits the shed in 10 minutes, we have access to the data. So if the news calls you the next morning and says, how much materials you put down last night, you have those numbers. We have those numbers. We have them that quick. Yes. Do you use any contract vehicles or are they all owned by All state owned. All state owned. All state owned. No contractors. Okay. How are, your, how are your sections or your routes and off ones calculated? Does the Sirius just give you back uh, lat longs? And yeah. We get lat longs from the Sirius application, then through our GIS, basically we process it into our route mile point range. So all the data is geo processed before it's actually displayed on that operator so summer. Who does that for you? GIS? Yeah. And well, and actually it's, yeah, they've created methodology or whatever to get it done. So, Jim? Steve, have you had the opportunity to use any of this data in fighting tort claims? Um, not yet, but in prior years, we've had tort claims that we had gotten that we know had we had ABL data, we could have used it. Um, I'm a believer that data will set you free. You either, in that case, you either say no and deny it or write the check. <laughs> Troy? With your question, Jim, I actually because I do plow as a, as a relief driver in Idaho. It's not my primary function, but I do help in that case. And we ended up going to court, and our AVL saved the guy that was in that situation because it, it, the guy had a timestamp of when this happened, and our AVL showed exactly where he was timestamped out, and we were nowhere in the vicinity, and the judge. Yeah. I'd forgotten about Troy's incident. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Right behind you. Have you extended this um, past winter maintenance? Um, not yet. Um, I truly believe, because of what we do, um, I've already been asked by our herbicide application crews to start utilizing this. That will be the next one. And then the one after that will be paint stripers. So anytime we have a truck that basically puts out a material, this will be applicable to it. Yeah. And we can use it for that. Sorry, I didn't wait for you. Okay, so when you're talking about interfacing with the GRS or LRS part in your routes, is that a layer of, of your snow routes? Is that on there? And do, can you tell and do reporting by efficiency for the snow route and the driver? Um, we will at some point in time. We haven't actually started doing that yet. Um, G our GIS department basically hasn't started overlaying the snowplow data into a map form. We're doing most of that reporting will be out of the war side of the system, which is kind of what we're working on right now. So we will get to there, but we're not, I can't say we're there right yet. Okay. So to kind of tie this all back together, um, okay. Do you actually 
asked for questions. I asked for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was just interested in what you're going to do with the data once you've used it for your operational purposes. So um, do you actually make this information available to the public so they know where you've got clear roads and where it's safe for them to travel? Um, as far as the AVL data, we're not based, we're not doing anything on a public facing side of this yet. Um, obviously it's all open for public record, records requests, but we're not, we've chosen at this point in time not to make it public facing this time. Um, one of the th you things that we are doing with this is our RWIS site reports right to our 511 system. So as our people are out there working a winter storm and clearing the roads, if someone's not out there to do an update to the 511, the RWIS site will create an automatic update into our 511 system. So it's, and that does that every 15 minutes. And you might explain the 511 system? Just um, winter road report, you know, when you need to go somewhere. I mean, I, you don't have that problem in Texas, Stuart. No, we I, don't. You know, so I, I can understand why you don't. That, uh, that's yeah. why we need to know. <laughs> yeah. So basically 511 is where you go to basically get the road conditions in the winter. Okay. So to kind of tie this all together, what we're really trying to do is, again, drive value. One of the values that we talked about is trying to improve safety. Um, ITD has been very aggressive in trying to move forward and improve safety of our overall condition. And so what we're doing is trying to manage and understand what we're doing if it's having any kind of effect. When it comes to safety in regards to winter maintenance, we're, trying, we're basically tracking crashes, fatalities, and serious injuries in winter. Um, this is the chart based on the data. Um, you can see it's had a downward trend anyway. So in 2011, again, from serious injuries, it continues to fall. Um, fatalities has continued to also fall during the winter months. We believe with what we're doing, with the information and the data, that we can truly continue to make this go down even further. So that is our goal and objective. Um, we all heard earlier, towards zero deaths is what we're all after. We're tr seriously trying to do it, and that's our end goal. The other component about the director's um, strategic plan is your mobility and your economic development. Um, for those that don't know, Idaho is a, pro a potato producing state. Um, we produce millions of potatoes every single year and obviously getting those potatoes to market is a big thing, especially when you can only haul one at a time. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? What type of traffic control is typically involved with a uh, with with a snowplow operation? Is it like a flashing arrow board or? or? In our case, we'll basically equip. We have our um, flashing lights that we put on the back of snowplow trucks, and that's it. He takes off down the road. No other traffic control associated with our operations. Have you tied employee performance to this? Mo yes. We just created, we, like I said, we're having, um, we have a new program called the TTO, Transportation Technician Operations. Um, basically, one of the requirements is, is they have to we meet their winter performance metrics on their roads. Their crew has to meet it for all of their road sections. If their crew meets it, then basically they as an employee are eligible to move to the next step in that progression on a horizontal career path. So they have to meet their winter performance metrics as defined. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Very good presentation. And, you know, this is going to be something we're going to see expanding across DOTs and it expanding into uh, other operations, like Steve mentioned. And um, so, interesting technology, and it's all about the data, folks. Thank you.